Now, you'll never guess where I am at the present moment. Oh, my goodness. Of all the places to be, I'm in the actual room where Dr. Knox received the bodies. Eight steps down from a town street, an entire building above us that used to be owned by Dr. Knox. But it was down here where he would cut up the various bodies, more often than not, with an audience who would pay a lot of money to come and see it. And yes, he learnt a whole range of different ways of of cutting into a body and sewing a body and amputating limbs and removing internal organs. So his skill increased. But there's hundreds and hundreds of people willing to pay a fortune in the same way that Michael Jackson did to attend autopsies, to look at people working on dead bodies. And that was what led to Michael Jackson's infatuation with the elephant man, wanted actually to buy his body. This super strong window, and yet it's the actual window. It hasn't changed. This is the window that Knox would close the curtains, put his gas lights on, and then get ready to work on the dead bodies given to him by Burke and Hare. And I'm fairly sure Burke and Hare weren't the only people providing him with material. And it's here on this table. It's a bit sugly. And this is where he did his work. So where better than to tell you an amazing story in a cemetery and you'd expect them to stay there not unreasonable you'd think but 200 years ago things were very different this was the time of the body snatchers now body snatchers were resurrectionists they were people who might dig up a freshly buried corpse in order to sell that on to a medical school or a private anatomical teaching institute perhaps the most famous uh, people associated with the uh, selling of corpses to anatomy medical schools were Burke and Hare. William Burke was born in County Tyrone to middle-class parents. Now, they'd hoped that he'd become a doctor. He didn't. He served in the Donegal Militia and he met his wife and they married within a month of meeting. However, with a wife came a father-in-law who refused to leave, so Burke abandoned the pair of them. He moved across Scotland to Falkirk and married somebody else, even though he was already married. He married Nellie. He became a hawker, spying and selling, then a cobbler, and then he moved down to Wearside to work along the banks of the River Weir. He was a very keen Catholic he always carried a Bible with him. Hare was also a William. He was also Irish from County Armagh. And some say he left Ireland after he impregnated a magistrate's daughter. He'd been merely an agricultural worker, so arrived in Scotland, finally moving to Edinburgh, where he lodged in Tanners Close with the Logue family. And we believe that one night... After getting Mr. and Mrs. Logue totally drunk, he smothered the man with a pillow. Within four days of the funeral, he was sleeping with his widow. Despite being uncouth, rough, and quite aggressive, she found him exciting until he began knocking her about. Margaret, who he called Wifey, was also, frankly, a hard-faced bitch who once had airs and graces, but life had kicked them out of her. So often, she would end up giving as good as she got. In Edinburgh, they met Hare, and the three were known for partying, raucous nights, 
in and out. And it was said that Margaret had had sex with both men. Having started grave robbing on Wearside, William Burke and William Hare realised there was a fortune to be made. There's many a graveyard across Wearside where the grave's still buried, but the body long gone. So they quit their temporary job on the docks where they supplemented their money sending bodies up to Edinburgh to travel to the very place where those bodies were sent. All of their recently dug up cadavers went to Edinburgh. Here, in this very room, Dr Robert Knox would use them in his anatomy lectures that earned him a small fortune. At that time, rich ladies who lunch were titillated by that kind of performance. They dug up hundreds of dead bodies in their time, with a couple of reports of one of them having sex with the body of a beautiful dead girl before passing it on. Their trick was to return the grave to looking immaculate, as if it had never been messed with. They eventually, when there weren't enough newly buried bodies, they eventually slid into their first murder, when their lodger fell ill with a fever. So they finished him off, and once again sold his corpse to Knox. Now, there was a time when councils began to place guards on graveyards to avoid the body snatchers. So Burke and Hare decided there must be easier ways than digging up the rain-sodden earth at four o'clock in the morning. And in February 1828, they had a miller called Joseph lodging with them who was dispatched whilst drunk once again with a pillow over his mouth. Within days, the lodger who took his place, Abigail Simpson, a salt salesperson, was also getting well and truly pissed and would later that night suffer a similar assault. Little did she know that wrapped in a tarpaulin under her bed was the body of Joseph, waiting to be delivered to Dr Knox. Simpson had asked what it was under there, had even tried to pull out the long parcel, but had been restrained by wifey. So to find victims, they merely needed whisky. Once the people were out of it, it seemed a simple procedure. Hair, being the biggest and strongest, suffocated them. While he was doing that, Burke lay across their torso to stop them wriggling free. As a method of death, it was totally efficient and silent. Once again, some believe that many of the dead women were used for sex before handing them over. For each corpse, ten pounds from the doctor and a decent standard of living ensued. A match seller believed to be a very heavy set man called Duggan or Dugan was the next lodger. He was already poorly with jaundice, suffering sweats and a fever. Rather more difficult to kill, because it took far more drink to get him drunk, and at sixteen stone he was almost impossible to suffocate. He only became unconscious when after a forty-minute struggle the bed snapped and he smashed his head on a skirting board. Burke and Hare, both sweating profusely, said that they would never offer lodgings to a larger person again. Now, for some reason, the man who owned this entire building that I'm standing in, Dr Knox, asked for the body of an old lady, the fresher the better. So that evening at the tavern, Hare chatted up a woman 25 years his senior. Her name was Bella, and she returned home with the three of them to finish off a bottle. Hare was believed to have said, I mounted the stinking mare, for it would have seemed wrong not to. Then, as she slept, held her nose and mouth shut until she swallowed her tongue and died. Two bodies in one old tea chest, and twenty pounds more for their coffers. Transporting bodies might have seemed easy, but neither Burke nor Hare had a carriage. 
what they used to use was a hand cart. So they loaded the hand cart with fish boxes to pretend they worked on the docks, dropping the bodies off along the way. Now, they were often stopped by inquisitive police officers, but with their jokey demeanour, they always managed to talk their way out of any actual search. They sometimes even carried fresh fish with them, bribing a policeman with a cod wrapped in a bit of newspaper. On one occasion, Burke and Hare cheated on wifey with Mary Paterson and Janet Brown, taking them back to a brother's house rather than home. But wifey discovered something was up and burst in, punching Hare across the face and trying to get at Burke. Brown, disgusted at discovering he was married, stormed out, losing a handful of hair to wifey on passing. Mary Paterson was still spark out, so they placated wifey by suffocating her and taking the body straight off to the doctor. Ferguson, Dr Knox's assistant, had an apartment in the attic here in this building, and he was amazed at how fresh the body was, asking where they'd got it from. Without a beat, they explained, it's a young woman who drank herself to death we bought it off her friend in Canongate. The doctor, Knox, was delighted. He put it straight into a vat of whiskey to preserve it and would later use it in front of an audience for a dissection. Burke and Hare were terrified that Janet Brown might come hunting for her friend. So night after night they searched Edinburgh for her without any success. Some say she ran off with a travelling salesman having no interest in Mary Paterson any, anymore. And next came the rather portly Mrs Haldane, a lovely laughing lady who wanted to be liked by everybody. She cleaned the apartment for Burke and Hare, cooked for them, washed their clothes. They liked her so much they actually wanted to keep her on. Problem was, she was honest, and that meant one drunken night she was going to be dispatched too. And off to the good doctor. Three weeks later, Peggy Haldane lodged at the apartment while she was looking for her mother, who just seemed to have vanished. Burke asked the young girl if she'd contacted the police and was relieved to hear she said no. Ah, don't worry then, lass. We'll go and see them with you tomorrow. However, there wasn't a tomorrow for young Peggy. Burke romanced her, had her, and whilst she slept, hit her with a brass tankard, killing her. Dr Knox only paid eight pound for the body because of the huge lump on her head. Lesson learnt. If they wanted the big money, the bodies had to be in perfect condition, but dead. Another Burke individual effort. An old woman lodged for one night. He got her drunk and smothered her, getting ten pound for another fresh example. A local cinder gatherer called Effie asked about the room, but Burke, who knew this girl quite well, tried to talk her out of it. It seems she'd just been kicked out of the tatty digs that she was in, and she needed anywhere for the night. Burke really liked her, but to her, business was business. They brought her to the stable, got her drunk, and smothered her. Now, just about the time they were due to take her body to the doctor, they stepped out of the apartment yard and walked straight into a policeman. The constable was carrying a drunken woman back to her lodgings by the docks. Burke said, Hey, don't you waste your night. Stick her on the cart. We're going that way. We'll take her for you. The policeman looked thrilled. He'd already carried her about half a mile and had a proper sweat on. He even loaded the poor woman onto Birkenhair's cart, inches from a tea chest, with poor Effie in it. And just before leaving, the officer said, Whoa, what's that smell? Birkenhair's heart sank until he added, Old fish boxes stink with the whole place. Night, boys. Instead, they took the woman into the yard, smothered her, added her to the tea chest, and over here, to the backyard of the Knox residence. 
it would be stored back there until it was ready to bring in here, placed on this table and dissected. The Burke and Hare Murders, 1827 to 1829. Number of murders, 16. During the 19th century, the Scottish capital of Edinburgh was leading the way in medical advancements, none more so than in the study of the anatomy of the human body, but this in turn led to a severe shortage of corpses for teaching and research purposes. It was not helped by the fact that Scottish law at that time said that the only corpses allowed for dissections were restricted to those who had died in prison, suicide victims, or orphans. So in the 1820s, an illegal trade in corpses sprung up as they could fetch around 8 to 10 pounds each, which was a small fortune in those days. There were even instances of grave robbing, but they were highly exaggerated by the newspapers. But nevertheless, they did happen. In Edinburgh, on the night of November 29th, 1827, a lodger died owing rent money to his landlord. That landlord was William Hare. Angry that the lodger owed four pounds in rent, Hare decided to illegally sell the body for anatomical studies in order to recuperate his losses. To do this, he enlisted the help of his friend, William Burke, who helped him remove the body from the coffin, replacing it with tanning bark. The body was hid under the bed. Later on, they sold the corpse to Dr. Robert Knox, who paid them the handsome sum of seven pounds and 10 shillings. Seeing a money-making opportunity, they thought of ways to provide more corpses for Dr. Knox without waiting for natural causes. Over the next 12 months, they are thought to have killed 16 people in total with the aid of their wives, mainly by getting their victims drunk and smothering them to death. They would later confess to killing an old woman and a dumb grandson. Burke said, killing the old cow was easy, but the young'un, I finished him, but I'll never forget the look on his little face. Pure shock, surprise, as if he had trusted me and had let him do. They couldn't fit both bodies into the tea chest, so wedged them both into a herring barrel. So on coming out, both bodies looked a bit squashed. So the good doctor only gave them eight pounds each. Now by this time, they'd raised so much money, they had an old horse to pull the cart and it had proven most useful, until the herring barrel incident. The horse simply refused to pull anything that big, and it ended up being dragged mainly by Burke and Hare. On returning to the yard, Hare was so angry with the horse, he got out his pistol and shot the horse in the head. It was sold as meat to the folks in the street. Burke and wifey MacDougall had a holiday returning completely skint to find Hare wearing a new suit and eating chicken, very swanky for the time. They knew he'd sold another body, despite him denying it. A young woman from the bar was missing. They knew the score. Burke and Hare came to blows and the partnership dissolved. Burke and his wife moved out. They were best mates and a few weeks later... They invited a washerwoman back to the apartment to tidy it up for the Burke family return. The woman never earned a penny. They simply got her drunk, and within the week, she was an exhibit at another medical show right here in this room. Up against the wall that I'm fa directly facing, hang on if I just walk across. So you've got the big table here for everything to... Big, heavy. Oh, you, I, I'm not sure I can even... Uh, can't move it. Loaded full of medical instruments. Lots of lights above it. But if you walk over here, you come across another ceramic-tailed window, and it said that at first, on the other side of this window, with two-way glass, they would line up his guests paying as much as 30 and 40 pounds, a fortune in the day. That's like three, 400 pounds now, just to get in and watch through the window as slices of flesh were removed, internal organs removed, private parts cut from the body. 
and some of the women allowed to handle this. Well, to make it easier, they eventually widened the building out, extending it. And now this is how how far it takes. To get to the table from the back wall, one, two, three paces. Big metal shelf here that would have had all his stuff on it. Then, to get across to the other side of the room, this is to show you how big it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty. And then, you're at the far wall. Long way. A lot of people you could get in there. And the most that he ever demonstrated in front of was 88 men and women to watch what he was doing. 88 people paying the equivalent of three, four, five hundred pounds a time. Multiply that up and realise just how much money you could make doing this type of thing. Well, the medical shows continued. One of wifey's relatives, Anne Dougal, arrived expecting to stay over. She did stay over, never to see the light of another dawn. The next victim was well known in Edinburgh, a crippled man known as Daft Jamie, who'd supported himself by begging. Everybody in Edinburgh knew Daft Jamie. The boys invited him in, only to find that he didn't like whiskey. He was a strong boy too. It took 30 minutes to kill him. But once everybody realised that Daft Jamie was seen to be missing, it even made the local newspaper. When the body was brought here, Dr Knox asked if the body was his. They said they were sure it wasn't. But Knox was beginning to know the score by now. So he removed Daft Jamie's head, removed his hands, and removed his crooked feet before displaying it so no questions could be asked. The family unit found themselves at a party with six or seven others and noticed the perfect next victim, Margaret Doherty. They spent the night plying her with drink, singing, dancing, snogging, having sex, and finally the others left, and she was murdered, choked with a sock forced down her throat. Now, this is where they made their big mistake. They all fell asleep, leaving the dead body, the cadaver, on the same bed they were sleeping in. However, two of the guests that had left earlier, the greys, returned looking for Margaret, and they found the entire drunken scene. They also saw Doherty dead with blood and puke on her face. They ran off to get the police before Burke and Hare woke up. Wifey and Hare's new wife saw them leave and offered them a ten-pound bribe to say nothing. Margaret was their friend. They had to tell. By the time the police arrived, the boys had already dropped the body off with Dr Knox. The police searched, finding odd clothing items, all claimed to be Burke's wife or Hare's next squeeze. They told him that she'd been drunk, she hadn't been dead at all. She woke up and she left. The Greys were mistaken. No harm had befallen her. One of Greys' friends had seen Bergen here delivering something to the surgery here, the surgery of Dr Knox, and told the police, and the police came here, visiting the doctor, just as he was laying out the body of Margaret Doherty. Everyone even remotely connected, were arrested. There's an old Edinburgh rhyme that people remember to this day. It goes like this. Up in the close and doon the stair, but and Ben were Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, knocks the boy who buys the beef. Hare instantly agreed to cop a plea for immunity. He told the entire story, blaming Burke, his wife, and the other woman as being responsible for the whole thing. He blamed Burke for being the only person to have murdered. Margaret Hare 
who knew everything, travelled to Glasgow where she was mobbed and assaulted, and finally took a boat back to Ireland. She'd been in and out of Hare's life, but knew everything he did. Burke was hanged in front of a crowd of 25,000 people on the 28th of January, 1829. His corpse was publicly dissected. A mini riot was caused because so many people wanted to see it, but limited places were available. They used the blood from his head to write down his autopsy using the blood in a quill pen. They wrote this in the blood. This is written in Burke's blood, directly taken from his open skull. Hare, who'd copped the play, was eventually released, but first asked if he could go straight back into prison and get locked up for his own security. There were mobs being outside the prison, demanding his death. Eventually, the authorities sneaked him out of the city and he took refuge in Dumfries. On one occasion, he was spotted in Dumfries. A crowd of 200 tried to snatch him from a local inn. He kicked out a window, hiding himself in a cell at the constable's station. Outside, a crowd of almost 500 gathered to hang the brute, throwing stones, battering the door, trying to tear down the cell wall where he was. It was such a riot, the militia were called. Over 100 constables to restore order. He was taken by them at three in the morning to the Annan Road. They guided him all the way down to the English border in Cumbria and told him never to return to Scotland. Hare entered England. He spent a little time in Carlisle and then no one knows what he did. But we're sure death and murder would have been there or thereabouts. The doctor was taken to court. He was tried and found innocent of all crimes and became an early cancer specialist towards the end of his days. Huge crowds thronged the court. And finally the verdict. This is actually a copy of the actual verdict given. Your body should be publicly dissected like your victims and anatomized. And I trust, if it ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved in order that posterity may keep remembrance of your atrocious crimes. And the skeleton was kept in a museum of medical science in Edinburgh the body of one of the two greatest or worst body snatchers in history. Wifey MacDougall's case was unproven and she was released. Gangs gathered outside her cops. They beat her up. They chased her out of Edinburgh. Some say she plied the same craft in Glasgow, though it was never proven. Only in a building like this, loaded full of atmosphere, I can comfortably close my eyes and see Knox working away on the bloodless cadavers of the bodies that he'd prepared with his assistant Ferguson and see it clearly. I can also see all of the well-to-do laughing and giggling and being shocked at seeing something tantamount to a horror show, a horror spectacle that they could take part in and be party to. Did Knox know that the bodies were being murdered just for him? He would have been stupid not to have thought it. He gets the benefit of the doubt. And some of the things that he learned about early cancers saved many, many lives. Yet, he deserved to go to the hangman too. 
Alan Robson in an amazing visit to Scotland from Edinburgh and the apartment of Dr. Knox. <laughs> <laughs>